And I'd like to acknowledge all of the Ag Canada scientists that came before me back in the 80s when uh, the big wheat midge pressure was on. Um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada threw a lot of scientific resources at trying to understand the wheat midge. And so there's six or seven uh, scientists that uh, were working at the, the Winnipeg station and at the Saskatoon station to try to understand all the different parts of what was going on with wheat midge in the field, how it interacted with plants. Could we find resistance in wheat? Was there a parasitoid? And so all these things kind of came together and here's my presentation and i'm standing on the shoulder shoulders of all those giants to uh present to you about wheat midge today so i've titled this the potential for the perfect storm and we'll get to that um the interest in wheat midge this year comes from a lot of wheat midge in the wheat midge forecast and so i'll tell you how that forecast comes about and uh show you some pretty pictures of midge or maybe they're not so pretty um, the problem in this case is the orange wheat blossom midge, and it's called orange because the adults are orange and the larvae are orange and the eggs are orange. And uh, Ian Weiss and Marge Smith called this the most serious insect pest of spring wheat in Western Canada. And so um, it's been in North America. It's not native. It was probably brought in with wheat, and it's been known to be here since the 1800s. Uh, it was first actually found in Manitoba in the early 1900s. And then we had outbreaks in the 1950s and then the 1980s. And that's when Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada started throwing those resources at it to try to understand this problem. And then we had a really big outbreak in the 1990s. And it's been fairly quiet since then, probably for a few reasons. So it, uh, kind of looks like a mosquito, the adult, the adult midge, like an orange mosquito that doesn't have the capacity to bite you. But while you're out in the field looking for wheat midge, you're typically also being hunted by mosquitoes. So I want you to look at the scientific name here. This is Cytodiplosis mosolana. And the S and the M become important later on when we're talking about the wheat midge resistance gene. So we've got some larvae right here sitting on the seed. These are second instars, and the first and second instars are the ones that destroy your seeds. So this is what a normal kernel should look like, and these kernels down here have been destroyed by the wheat midge larvae. You can actually see two third instar larvae hanging out on this shriveled kernel. So we call these unharvestable, and these damaged kernels will blow up the back of the combine and they represent yield loss so you won't even see these seeds but you will see the yield loss so back in the 80s Owen Olfert and the scientists went out and they determined that uh, if you had 30 percent of your kernels infested you were going to take a 40 percent yield loss in the field and they had fields that were up to 90% with the kernels infested. And so we're looking at about an 80% yield loss at, uh, at those levels. So that is not something that we want to see happen again. So the economic thresholds were worked out and it's a visual count. So they're not the easiest or most pleasant thing to do. Like I said, you're gonna be hunted by mosquitoes because you're gonna be out in the evening at dusk um, or up early in the morning at dawn because the wheat midge likes to come up and lay eggs on the heads when the uh, when the temperature is about 15 degrees and it's calm. So, and even if there's a lot of humidity too, they like that. And so when we have them in our uh, bioassay chambers, we try to maintain the humidity at about 70%. So you're standing in your field and you're trying to determine if you have wheat midge and you see a few of these orange flies flying around. And down here on the bottom, this is a sweep net. And all of these little yellow things are the anthers and all of the orange things, those are all wheat midge. So you don't wanna see that, but you can use a sweep net to tell if you've got wheat midge out in your field. Um, but if you wanna tell what your, your uh, thresholds are, if you wanna maintain your yield, you're looking for one adult midge on five heads. And at this level, it's about a 15% a yield loss. So this is where you would want to get on your sprayer 
and uh, take care of those midge if you didn't have midge tolerant wheat in the field. So at the elevator, the, uh, the grain can get downgraded as well if it has too much midge damage. And so to maintain your optimum grade, you're looking for one adult midge on about 10 wheat heads. And so the danger zone for midge is right when the boot splits and your head is visible. So the wheat midge can start laying eggs then until about mid anthesis and then the levels of acid in the seed go up and the wheat midge don't fare very well on those seeds and so those are our economic thresholds there so if you saw this in your field we've got seven midge larvae here but we're looking at about four heads so one midge sorry not larvae midge adults these are all females they're up on the heads and this is way over the threshold. So if we even had just one of these on these four heads, we would be at that yield threshold. So in terms of the life cycle, fortunately, there's only one generation per year and they go through three larval instars. That means the larvae shed their skin three times. So they start out in the ground as this cocoon here and they, that's how they spend the winter. So you can see they've got cocoons over here. So this is the overwintering cocoon. They can actually stay in the ground in their cocoon for, for many years if conditions aren't right. So if it's too dry, they can stay in the ground, kind of like a ticking time bomb in your field. So here's what the mids cocoons look like compared to a canola seed. And when we get the rains in the springtime, the same rains that get your spring wheat up and out of the ground, also get the wheat midge up and out of the ground. And the midge adults are really well synchronized with the heading time of spring wheat because they use the uh, same warming conditions in the soil and the same rain events. So Bob Elliott figured that you needed about 25 millimeters of accumulated rainfall through May to get these cocoons to come out of the ground. So the cocoons then have a third instar midge larva and they'll their cocoon and the larva will crawl up to near the surface where it pupates and so um, this is a complete metamorphosis and the pupa then comes out right at about the time that the boot splits or even a little bit later if uh, if the rain event sort of happened later and uh, but remember that you've got your primary heads but you've also got tillers coming up so your tillers can be um, affected by later emerging wheat midge. So you need to be vigilant in your field when any of your heads are, are a susceptible stage. So at, uh, when the adults come out, um, that's when you can start looking. And this is around the third week, sorry, the fourth week in June to about the July long weekend. So you're out in your field looking for wheat midge when you wanna be at the lake, and watching fireworks for Canada Day, and the midge are coming out to lay eggs on your wheat. So here's what the adult wheat midge looks like close up. This is a male, it's got a claspers on the end here, and you can look at the antenna, and he's got these really long um, sensile, and he uses these to smell the female. And so this is where the pheromone comes in. So these are all pheromone receptors, and he smells his way to the females. And so we've used that with a pheromone trap to try to assess when those, those uh, adult midge start coming out of the ground. So here's a female. She's got an ovipositor down here on the bottom. And this is how you'll find her during the daytime. So she sits down in the canopy and only comes out at dusk. So at about 8.30 is when she starts moving up and laying eggs on the heads, if it's a nice calm night. So she's got smaller antennae than the males as well. So the male antennae would be longer than that because the female doesn't need to smell pheromone, but the male does. So then they lay eggs up on the heads and these are this is a close up of wheat midge eggs. So we've got a bunch just inside the, uh, the edge of the gloom here. And like I said before, they're orange, just like the, uh, just like the adults are. You can actually see the little red eye spot there. And this is typically how many eggs you would get. So the female came in here and laid a clutch of about four eggs. And so those four eggs will destroy that one, that one seed. So 
those eggs will hatch in about four or five days after being laid and you get these really mobile first instar larvae and they'll move down and they start feeding on the kernel and uh, this is when the sm1 gene actually acts and so it acts on these first instar larvae and these are the ones that wind up dying when the sm1 gene kicks in so under severe infestation, this is probably a severe infestation here, where you get more than three or four per kernel. And then they turn into this second instar, which is really highly mobile. And here's an idea of what the first instar size looks like compared to the second instar. And they're so mobile that this was the best picture I could get. It kept running away on me. This is the third instar. So once they're done feeding and destroying the seed, they actually sit around in the skin of the second instar, probably to maintain humidity. And this is the third instar in there. And this is the one that will drop to the ground to create that overwintering cocoon and spend the winter like that. So they take a little bit of moisture. So those August uh, rainstorms that come through will get your third instars to drop to the ground, but also a heavy dew will do the same thing as well. If it's really dry, you can even get a heavy dew on your swaths and they will drop into the ground from there if they haven't dropped off the head yet. And so they will shed this second instar skin and they crawl down into the ground. And so I got a video of that for you. So check this out. These are those third instar midge larvae. They've shed their skin, Let's sped it up for you. And just watch these guys as they bury down and into the ground. And uh, about three weeks later, they will have formed that overwintering cocoon and uh, they're ready for spending the winter. So this is my wheat midge nursery at the Saskatoon farm with the forestry farm over here. And this is a wheat midge pheromone trap. So we keep the pheromone trap at the, the level of the top of the crop because that's where a female would be sitting and pheromone calling for a male. So the lure here is loaded up with the pheromone. It was actually a, a team from the Grease Lab at Simon Fraser University that, uh, that figured out what the wheat midge pheromone was, and then we can use it now against them. So down on the sticky trap here, we have male wheat midge that got lured in thinking they were flying to a female. So back in 2019, we actually had to water the wheat midge nursery because we didn't have any rain in May. And I can actually show you what, uh, what that kicked off right here. So we watered uh, on the 27th of May and it kicked off this, this uh, peak of wheat midge here by the long weekend in July. And then it finally rained on the 17th of June and we had another peak of wheat midge over here that was kicked off by that second amount of rain. So we actually had two peaks at our Saskatoon farm. And these other locations down here were not irrigated. And so we had really low numbers of wheat midge. And so this is good for farmers, but it's not good when you're testing wheat or wheat midge damage. In 2020, we had plenty of rain through May and all of the sites had pretty high numbers of, of uh, males on the pheromone trap. And you can see they were coming out here from the third week in July, kind of the end of the third week in July all the way through and then they dropped off by by the end of July here. Sorry, this is the last week in June to the end of July. So we've got about a, a five week trapping period there where the midge was coming out. So if you think about your wheat heading at this point in time, your primary tillers are, are uh, probably right here and then all of your other tillers would be in this area here. So you're not out of the danger zone if the midge just keeps coming out of the ground. So here are my midge technicians and what they are doing, what Mojgan is doing right here is she is dissecting wheat heads. And so we're scoring the wheat kernels as being damaged or undamaged or damaged harvestable, which, uh, which is something that will, will downgrade your crop or damaged unharvestable, which is where it's just been completely destroyed. This is Haruan over here. He's got a, a bag on his head. He's actually dressed up as uh, as the yield from one of our canola plots for Halloween. So this this is what we collect, collected the canola seeds in and he was busy cleaning them for me. So we're looking for new anti-midge traits with uh, with this whole setup. 
And so these are all wheat midge third instar larvae in here that we've threshed off the heads really gently with a belt thresher. So this is how we get the wheat midge to do our experiments with. So let's talk about some soil cores. So back in uh, back when they started doing the um, forecasting maps for wheat midge, they used an equation and plot from about 15 to 17 of these soil cores in a field to determine what the midge pressure is in the field. So what they're doing with the soil cores here, these are some of my summer students, is they are digging up a little bit of uh, soil and then those go back to the lab in the bag here that Mickey's holding and we wash those overwintering cocoons out. And so we were doing this for a different project in Saskatchewan. Uh, we have a, there's a private contractor hired by the province in Sasquatch that goes out and does this survey and she'll survey 421 fields in Saskatchewan. Alberta's about the same and it's Shelley Barkley uh, with the Alberta Forestry, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry that does that survey in Alberta. And so they bring the wheat cores back to the lab, they wash out the uh, wheat and it's based on John Doan's paper back in 1986. And then they'll actually take those overwintering cocoons and pop them open and look for parasitism. And so if they find that the cocoon is parasitized, it actually comes out of the sample and it's not counted towards the forecasting map. So here's the Alberta forecast map in 2020. Each of these dots here represents a field that was soil cored. So this is a lot of work in the fall. Um, 2020 in Alberta, there was only this kind of little area here where there was wheat midge and then that grew. Uh, here's, here's, uh, yeah, there's that area in Alberta. This is Saskatchewan in 2020. And we had a few pockets and the pockets correlate really well to where it was wet that year. Now, this is the forecast that we didn't want to see happen. This is 2021, and those red zones have grown really big and are covering a good portion of our growing region. Alberta has expanded too from this kind of one spot there up into kind of a red zone right up here through the Lloydminster area. And so this, uh, this is based on viable midge. So these are midge that will come out as little orange flies in the springtime. If we get the rains. So back in the 90s, the group, our Ag Canada group at uh, Winnipeg, they were looking for some kind of resistance in wheat. And in a winter wheat, they found this resistance and they termed the gene SM1. So that's Cytodiplosis mosolana, SM, and one for the first gene and one for the only gene right now. And they were able to cross that into spring wheat. And uh, 2007, Unity was registered and it came to market in 2010. And so that means we've had 11 years now of midge tolerant wheat on the market. And now, just last year, we had 35 midge tolerant wheat varieties across all the wheat classes. So I was presenting this before, and this is um, these were infographics that the midge tolerant wheat group puts out. And so that, that is uh, synthesis, and they make these great infographics. And they figured that $36 per acre in yield and grade benefits is what the midge tolerant wheat will get you. And so that was based on 40 bushels per acre, and also based on $6 a bushel wheat. And so CCAN did some um, did some math and said, but if we're getting 80 bushels per acre and we're getting $8 a bushel and using that 15% yield loss, which is that yield threshold, it's actually $96 an acre, which is what the yield and grade benefits are. So that is a that is a great benefit. And uh, yeah, so these newer varieties all have, you know, they're good rust tolerance. They have good FSB tolerance, fusarium, and so there's uh, there's no good reason not to use the midge tolerant wheat if you're in one of those zones that might need it. So how SM1 works is it works on these first instar larvae. When they first tap into the seed, they start 
they start feeding and then the plant reacts really quickly and it increases the levels of these two acids and it's the ferulic acid that they really don't like the taste of. The first instar larvae stop feeding and they just starve to death because they're tiny little legless grubs and they can't really go anywhere else. And so you get some dead first instar larvae and hardly any damage on your seeds, which is great. So, no, oh, I went backwards there. So there is no plan B is right now what the, uh, what the slogan is. So we've got these red midge here represented. And so um, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about how the refuge works and how we can protect the SM1 gene and how this all kind of came to be. So you're looking for that VB, which stands for varietal blend. And so this is a refuge. So it's an interspersed refuge where you've got susceptible seeds, so the refuge variety, mixed in with the midge tolerant or SM1 variety. So that's represented by the red ones and the refuge is represented by yellow wheat. And back when they were looking at wheat midge, they actually had about 2% of midge larvae that would survive to adulthood on SM1 midge tolerant wheat. So they called that virulent midge. And so it's represented as red in these infographics here. So the refuge is a mix of 90% SM1 and 10%. As I'm sure you're well aware. And so this refuge was supposed to keep the uh, SM1 gene viable. So I'll tell you how that works here in a second. So this is a virulent midge finding a non-virulent midge. Now, in the field with your interspersed refuge, these midge are just going to be all over the place in your field. And without the proper refuge, and you're losing those susceptible seeds, and you just keep planting that, that same crop over and over again, eventually you're not going to have any susceptible seeds, and your refuge is down to 100 or 0, which is now represented here by all SM1. So this is just nothing but midge tolerant wheat. And in this case, all of the non-virulent, so these are the midge that are susceptible to the SM1 gene, they all die because they're on SM1 wheat. But then we've got this 2% subpopulation that is a, uh, the virulent is um, a recessive trait. And these guys survive all the way through to adulthood. And they drop to the field floor, they dig into the ground, and then we see them again next year. And if they're the only ones there, they're gonna find each other and they're gonna mate and they're gonna pass on their virulence to their offspring. And they're gonna have a field day on the SM1 wheat here and the population is going to build up. And then we've lost the SM1 gene. And so the math that was done early on said that without this refuge, 10 years is about all we'd have with the SM1 gene. We've had 11 years now and we don't have reports of, mirulent, or of virulent midge populations. So this uh, refuge system seems to be working. So here we are back up to the refuge. We've got the, the uh, interspersed refuge here with a susceptible wheat. And in this case, our midge are just all throughout the field. We've got our, our uh, susceptible ones and our virulent ones. And so a few of them survive, but when they come up next spring, the virulent ones, the hope is don't find another virulent one and they mate with a non-virulent midge and their offspring are still susceptible to the SM1 gene. And so they will die when they feed on SM1 wheat. And so the non-virulence is the dominant trait. And, and so in this case, the refuge is, is maintained. So 90 years is what the prediction is for the SM1 gene. So that is pretty great. And so this is why we've got the midge tolerant wheat stewardship in, in place. And you can take an online training course and learn all of this. And all of these infographics are available on the midge tolerant wheat website as well. And so why you sign this and why you only use the certified seed from uh, for one year post certified is uh, to limit the use of farm saved seed just to maintain this refuge. So I'll give you uh, an example here. We don't want the refuge to change. We want it to maintain at 90-10. 95-5 is about our cutoff for uh, 
losing that refuge. So on a really heavy midge infestation year, we could lose say 5% of those susceptible seeds, let's say 50%, sorry, of those susceptible seeds. And then our ratio drops to 95.5. Now, if we have another strong midge year and we plant that exact same um, seed lots, then we're down to 97.5 and 2.5. And that refuge is too low to maintain the SM1 gene in the field, and we have the potential for those virulent midge to start building up. Another year, we're down to 99.1, and refuge is basically lost in your field. So this is why we don't want to go past year one of post certified. So we want to keep the SM1 gene going, and this is why we've got the stewardship agreement. And hopefully, now you've understood uh, a bit more about the refuge system and how it works. And so we don't have any reported breakdown yet, but we've also had a lot of dry years as well, and not a lot of midge pressure. But field to field can be can be very different as well. So there's the Midge Tolerant Wheat website, and this whole initiative is powered by Western Grains, and uh, that's where the Midge Tolerant Wheat infographics came from, and the Canadian Wheat Research Coalition has now taken that over. So got this. Uh, this was from last year, so these are virulent midge all flying around this 10 years of stewardship and so far so good with uh, midge tolerant wheat. So thank you to the growers and we use that number of $1 billion in yield benefits over the whole life of midge tolerant wheat so far. All right, see if I can get past this screen. I have to end the show there. Yeah, we'll go on. Now, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the parasitoid here. And so I've got our Field Heroes infographic. That was also powered by Western Grains. And a beneficial insect is something that kills the pest insect. So here I am riding a ladybug, which is an amazing beneficial insect. And the wheat midge gets attacked by this little wasp here that actually introduced itself and spread across the prairies. It basically chased the wheat midge across the prairies, and it's called Macroglenys penetrans. And it is really well synchronized with wheat midge, which is really well synchronized with the spring wheat. So here's Macroglenys penetrans, and it's looking for wheat midge eggs and first instar larvae to lay its own eggs into. And so this midge can reduce next year's, sorry, this wasp can reduce next year's midge population by 30 to 40% on average. And so these guys will come out about four or five days after the wheat midge adults come out. And that is because there's going to be eggs and first in star larvae four to five days after the wheat midge adults come out. And so if you spray your field too late, you can actually wind up killing these guys in the field. So you can see them during the daytime if you get out a sweep net, or even if you just get up close to the heads, you can see them crawling around on the heads looking for the uh, eggs to lay into. And that 10% refuge also helps to maintain the populations of this parasitoid. And so I also want to mention that last year's wheat is potentially this year's canola. And so when these guys emerge from the ground, they might be in your canola field and they will feed on nectar produced by your canola flowers. And so you also want to be cautious of spraying your canola at uh, that flowering time when you might have these guys in your field getting a snack. And so there was some evidence from Alberta that their levels of parasitism had dropped to the lowest point that they've ever seen before. And so Shelly was telling me that earlier on in 2021. And then North Dakota, Janet Nodal's down in North Dakota, and she's looking at this, and she said they their parasitism levels have dropped to about 8%. So we checked it out in Saskatchewan, and our parasitism levels are still at about 30% across Saskatchewan. So for whatever reason, we haven't dropped here. But it's probably likely due to low wheat midge populations, and you get low populations of the parasitoid as well. So this is just total parasitized to the wheat midge that they're finding in the field. And you can actually see from 2018, we've got a big increase in wheat midge to 2019, and then a, another increase again in 2020. And so this is what the forecast map is based on, is this blue column here. 
So just to summarize, we've got 2021 forecast showing a lot of red areas for wheat midge. And so with some May rains, we could be in the perfect storm position for midge. And so your wheat midge tolerant wheat has the same or better yields, even under low midge pressure. And then there's the whole lifestyle thing. You're not sitting around in the field on the July long weekend looking for midge. It's plant it and forget about it. And then the refuge in the wheat helps to preserve those parasitoids. And then you don't need to use chemical sprays. We've actually lost one tool in the toolbox recently where chlorpyrifos is being taken off the market. So now there's only dimethoate registered for control of wheat midge. So I'd like to acknowledge all these uh, wonderful funding sources for my projects. Throw up my Twitter handle again and my Ag Canada email in case you need to look for me and then acknowledge Synthesis Network for all those, those uh, midge taller and wheat infographics that we saw there and all the Ag Canada scientists that came before me. And with that, we'll bring it to a close and open the floor up to questions. Okay, thanks, Tyler. Quick question that I've received a couple times, so I'll get the question started. Uh, we see there's Saskatchewan and Alberta midge forecast maps. How do we tell what the midge pressure is in Manitoba? That is a good question, Jim. So. We don't have any forecasting maps for Manitoba. So we don't have that on the go in the fields. So your options are putting up pheromone traps to know when those midge start coming out and also to uh, just get out in your field and, and have a look. So yeah, um, if we look back at that Saskatchewan map down in where the Manitoba growing region kind of hits the Saskatchewan, map there's actually a big red zone there so there's a good chance that it's just bleeding over into manitoba as well so thanks for the question okay. any questions from anyone else i could pop open the chat here in case anybody wants to write in the chat so uh, another one i've got a couple times is if a producer wants to participate in the midge larvae survey, say this coming fall, how do they do that? So if you're in Saskatchewan, you can get in touch with the provincial ministry and they can add you to the list. If you're in Alberta, you can get in touch with uh, Shelly Barkley there and she can add you to the list. And so, yeah, especially in Saskatchewan, it's all permission based. So we have to get permission before we go on anybody's land. So yeah, we can add you to that. They can add you to that list. Um, I mostly, I just look at the data after it's published. So I'm not involved with the initial data collection. So thanks to the provinces for doing that. All right, well, I must've done a really great job of telling my story here. Okay, well, I had a couple um, points I wanted to quick go over. Uh, Jody, can you see my screen now? I just wanted to confirm it's up. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Good. So, a couple of things uh, while we had it on, and we thanks Tyler for coming on. There was a lot of good information there. Um, You're welcome. But, Thank you for the invitation, Jim and Jody. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks. So, one of the things, and the reason we do this, we we do know the midge. Uh, like any insect, the population's up, the population's down, it kind of cycles. And uh, so there's those natural cycles and then the weather conditions have a lot to do with it, as Tyler explained. So this year, uh, coincidentally, we are launching, as most of you know, we're launching AAC Leroy VB, which is a very high yielding, um, very strong disease resistant, midge tolerant CWRS. And so it coincides with that in that really part of the message on this is going, this is a strong variety. But because of some of those concerns we have around midge and potential high infestations of midge this year, if the weather conditions are right, and that's yet to be seen, um, really growing a strong agronomic midge tolerant variety is a very uh, easy ins insurance package against and insurance protection against midge. Uh, as Tyler indicated, 
your options if you don't have a midge tolerant variety is you are going out during that susceptible time and scouting and doing some type of uh, application to control the midge which also controls the parasitoids and anything else. Um, it's a much simpler, easier, lower risk, uh, higher paying return by growing a midge tolerant wheat if you are concerned of that at all. And so that was a quick discussion on Leroy. The other point we clearly are making on Leroy is that even if you have a low concern on midge or in a non-midge area, you are growing a superior variety and the midge tolerance is just a bonus that's in there in case the midge ever flare up. So I do know there's regions of Western Canada, a uh, good example is uh, Northeast Saskatchewan. Midge is prominent there most years. A lot of growers grow midge tolerant varieties every year just because they can't take the risk. So they're naturally gravitating to these new varieties very quickly because they are agronomically strong. But even when you get in these other areas that are showing lower midge pressure, uh, these are still superior varieties to what's on the market right now. And so the yield advantage, as you see, uh, is substantial versus some of these non-midge tolerant varieties on the marketplace. So really, it's the best of both worlds. The growers can get a very high yielding, very agronomically strong variety. Plus, they've got the coverage uh, and the midge, the SM1 gene, the midge tolerance in there so that they don't have to be worried about that, don't have to be going out scouting for the, the midge fly uh, when they probably want to be doing a couple other things. So um, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but really I wanted to put out, there's three really good new midge tolerant varieties that have come on the market. AAC Leroy VB is the Alliance Seed One, Starbuck and Wheatland, most of you've probably heard of, depending on the geographies, one or both. Uh, they're two good secan varieties. All three are a clear step up in agronomic performance and yield. And so all three are good. But when people say, well, what's the difference? Well, uh, a bit of reading on here, but really what it comes down to, all three are really, really good. Leroy and Starbuck do show a slight yield advantage over Wheatland. Leroy and Starbuck clearly have stronger Fusarium head blight resistance. Uh, Wheatland's a little bit shorter and stands a little bit better. And, and Leroy's a couple days earlier. So when you look at it saying, you know, in most areas of Western Canada, I want to yield. Early maturity is always a bonus in much of the central and east prairies, I need the fusarium head resistance, fusarium head blight resistance. And that's why we're strongly promoting Leroy and getting out there. But also we know even if the midge don't show up this year, farmers will be very, very happy with the agronomic performance and the yield. So this was the, because these haven't been grown a lot head to head yet, because they're both, all three of these are being launched this year. This is the data that we have available to us when these three varieties are being registered. And as you can see, um, compared to the Czech varieties and the average of the Czech varieties, they're all really, really good. And we do see Starbuck and Leroy showing a little bit of a yield advantage to Wheatland. Uh, we're showing Leroy having a very slight yield advantage to Starbuck. All three are a little different. Uh, clearly the strengths of them are saying, if you have any concerns about Fusarium head blight, do not grow Wheatland. Leroy and Starbuck are your comparables. Um, if you're looking for something that you can get into the bin a little bit sooner, go with Leroy because it's earlier than the other two. Um, and strength-wise, they're all very, very good agronomically. You see the Leroy uh, disease package is extremely strong across the board, and, and so you can't go wrong with this. Quick reminder, and uh, Tyler mentioned about it, is all midge tolerant wheat varieties in, in Western Canada must go out with the midge tolerant wheat stewardship agreement. And that's not new, that's from day one. And that's everybody's midge tolerant line that's out there. So for anyone who has not received the training yet, you must uh, do the online training before you can uh, participate and actually sign growers up on this and sell a midge tolerant variety. I've got the website there, midgetolerantweek.ca. It's a relatively quick, straightforward training module that's online uh, that really explains uh, about the 
stewardship agreement, but also explains in more detail why we are doing it so that you can explain to your grower customers, this is why it's there. If we don't manage this properly, within the next decade, we will lose the effectiveness of the S1, SM1 gene, and we will not have niche tolerant wheat, uh, which would be a massive step, step backwards. So until we discover something that's better protection than SM1, we need to protect that gene very diligently. And this is why it's in place. And so a reminder, no matter what midge tolerant variety you're selling, make sure you're doing this, make sure your growers understand this, uh, because we don't want to go back to a position where uh, the midge can flourish unha unhampered at all. They Then when the conditions are right, they do really explode. Clearly, the midge tolerant wheat has been a very good management tool to help keep it in check, reduce your yield loss, reduce your grade loss, and not allow those to uh, grow unhampered. So to wrap up my part of it, just want to put up there, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get a hold of me, Jody Karlowski, Colin Tanner. Uh, if you have really detailed midge questions, clearly Tyler is the contact. He's the expert on this. Um, but we want to make sure that you've got the information to properly explain this to your grower customers and, and make sure you're setting them up for success. And, and we do know there's been significant interest in Leroy. Uh, we can only assume based on what we're hearing, there's also significant interest in Starbuck and Wheatland. We want to make sure you're positioning the right varieties and, and don't be scared at all about positioning Leroy against any variety out there. Uh, because there's very, very few parts of Western Canada where Leroy is not a phenomenal choice for your growers. So.